know if it's going to see us very well, but Shalom Aleichem, Abuchim Abuim, welcome to Netzari Nazarene Torah Study Jacksonville. I have a few guests with me today that we're going to talk about something. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves real quick? Um, my name is Charles. Shalom, Shalom. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah. So we got two people, um, and we're going to be discussing uh, dietary instructions. So for some people, this can be a touchy subject. I don't really care. I mean, it's just eating. So there are more things to get stressed out. There are things you can get more stressed out about than eating, but oh well, we're just going to learn about some certain things. But uh, we got a, a lot of uh, questions. We got I made a questionnaire where we have about like 10 different questions that I think are important to this. And um, before we get straight into the dietary instructions, let me pull up my e-sword real quick. I'm going to need that. That's a man's greatest weapon is the word of God. How about that? But um, so before we get into dietary instructions, like stuff about kashrut and all that, uh, you got to have some basic foundations before we get into that. And I think I really, me personally, I think that starts in with the, just Torah, the, the mitzvot, the commandments of Hashem. So let me see. I'm still waiting for Esau to pull up because I'm going to need my scriptures. So while that's taking a while, the first question that we have that I got uh, pulled up right here is what is a mitzvah? What is a commandment? So basically, they are the instructions that are found in the Torah. There's supposedly, there's like 613 of them, quite a lot, which people say that's a lot to keep. But if you actually read the, read the Chadashah, the New Testament, there's actually over a thousand in the New Testament. So you shouldn't really be complaining. <laughs> that seems like a lot. And all these mitzvot, they're divided into what is called positive commandments and negative commandments. So not positive in the sense that they're cool and negative as in they're bad, but for example, a positive commandment is when Hashem tells you to do something, like do this, do that, like, you know, um, and the negative commandments is don't do this or don't do that. So like, a, you know, um, we're trying to think of a positive commandment. <coughs> so, so for example, for uh, six days, you know, Hashem told us to work and the seventh day he told us to rest. That's a positive commandment. What he told us, a negative commandment would be him telling us not to do any work on the Shabbat. So that's an example. Um, there are plenty others. Um, the dietary instructions would fall, I would say, I, I want to say follow unto, under the category of negative commandments, because he doesn't necessarily tell us, he doesn't tell us what to eat, he just most, most, ugh, he basically tells us what not to eat. You know, he says, these are food for you, but he doesn't tell us to eat it. I don't, he doesn't command anywhere, he doesn't command us anywhere to eat some beef. Like, he doesn't tell us to, thou shalt eat beef, like, no, twice a week, no. But he does tell us not to eat certain things. So also that there's the Ten Commandments about the commandments. Everybody knows about the Ten Commandments. But interestingly, if you actually look in the Hebrew, the Ten Commandments aren't actually called the Ten Commandments. They are actually called because the word for commandment is mitzvah, and in plural that's mitzvot. So if it were the Ten Commandments in Hebrew in the Torah, it would say aserat ha mitzvot. But it actually says, Aserat Hadibrot. Dibrot is like the feminine plural, and it means like words, utterances, like sayings. Like, I got ten things for you, like ten sayings, or stuff like that. Utterances, there's many ways to say it. But these ten commandments are actually called the ten utterances. They are commandments, and they're basically a summary of the Torah, at least the way I look at it. So moving on from there, the next thing to, that is important to define is, what is sin? <coughs> so... So a linguistic way of looking at it is the word Torah, I think it comes from, the, I think it's the word Ya'ar, no, Ya'ra that it comes from. It basically means like to take aim, with like a bow and arrow, just to take aim, that's what one thing Torah can mean. Chata basically means the opposite. Chata means to miss the mark. So if you take aim and you let go, you know, you miss the mark. So doing, doing Torah, you know, you're taking aim, but if you sin, you're missing it, you're missing the mark. You're, um, not fulfilling Torah um, and it's funny because the the most some of the most straight up definitions of what sin is comes in the New Testament and I'm going to read the first one is from Shaul Hapush this is in Romans 7 7 let me pull that up real quick let me find that no I did not know no I didn't really care let me see Romans 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 
Romans, one of my favorite of Shaul's uh, letters. It's chapter 7, I think, verse 7. Is it verse 7? <coughs> so this is right This is right after, I think, when Hashem is telling, uh, talking about how we've been released from the Torah, not in the sense that we've been released for our duty to keep it. We have been released from the Torah in the sense that Mashiach, that Yeshua, died to the Torah because he's revelating this to the law of marriage. So when a man dies from the dies, he is free from the law of marriage, and Hashem or Shaul is kind of equating to that. To when Yeshua died on the cross, we've been like since Yeshua represents us, we've been released. Um, but that doesn't mean the law died. That means we died. So we're dead to the law. The law's not dead. But anyways, um, but after this, he says, "What shall we say then? Is the law sin?" He says, "God forbid. Nay, I had no, I had not known sin, but by the law or by the Torah." For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But so, that's an example, you know. If I didn't, And that's where we get into um, the dietary instructions in a minute. Another place <coughs> where sin is defined is in 1 John 3, 4. 1 Yochanan 3, 4. Let me find that real quick. It's possible this tablet can this uh, tablet can die. So if it does, I'm just going to use my phone. So don't be freaking out, people. I've had to do multiple videos on YouTube before. Um, so First John three four, he says, "Who?" This is the King, uh, King James version. Whosoever committeth sin, transgress, transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So if you transgress what the Torah says, that's a sin, according to Yochanan. Um, some people just translate it slightly differently. Like, for example, some people sometimes it says, Whosoever committed sin commits lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. It's kind of the same thing. It's going against the law or being without the law. Um, so, moving on from that, it's important to know, you know what a mitzvah is, what the sin is. It's going against the Torah. So another interesting, another important question we got to go over to is, um, does God's commandments change? Or are they only temporary? Um, well, to me, I would say no, because one, the every most people would agree that God's Torah, and even people who don't like agree with like trying to keep Torah, following Yeshua, and trying to keep Torah, um, they would agree that you know the Torah reflects God's character. There are instructions that reflect His character, but. The Malchi Hanavi, the prophet Malachi, says something in interesting in chapter 3, verses 6. If I can find that, where is that? Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, am I at the wrong, am I at the right place? 3, verse 6. Hold on, let me pull it up. Malachi 3, 6. I might have to look it up because I think I put in the wrong reference. Or is it 6-3? It might be 6-3. Nope, it's not 6-3. That's funky. Uh, I hate it when this happens. Must have been doing this too fast. Sometimes you go too fast and you kind of... I can just fact check myself real quick and go to Google. Rabbi Google is what some people call it. So there's, there's this important place in um, in the in one of the prophets that he kind of explains something that I think really relates to God's character let me find it one quick not to make you guys wait I change there we go Michael Malachi 3.6 oh that's why it's Malchi Hanavi not Micha Hanavi oh my gosh those, these guys are just too similar. I knew something was up. Malchi Hanavi, Perak Lamed. No, no, Perak Gimel Vav. So it's Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. He says, For for Ani Adonai, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So Hashem says here very clearly that he doesn't change. So to me, if the law is a reflection of his character, then, and God doesn't change, then his reflection shouldn't change either. Because in order for the law to change, which is a reflection, some, whatever is looking in the mirror has to change. So like, 
So if what I'm seeing in the mirror changes, that means I have to change as well. Like there's, you can't have one without the other. So if God's character don't change, his, based on that, his law wouldn't change either if it truly reflected his character. So let's go into the next point. Um, God's commandments don't change. So let me let me show you, demonstrate that in another place to go to is Deuteronomy 4.2 or Devarim in Hebrew is what we call it. I love this e-sword thing. You just this is how I cheat whenever I'm at the shul at the synagogue. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm always the one who reads the scriptures Yochanan puts out because I'm cheating. I got this. Yeah, it's very quick. <coughs> Let me find it. Which passage? It was uh, four two. There you go. So Deuteronomy four two. If you guys have any input, you know, just feel free to talk. You know, you don't have to let me take over this thing. I don't want to feel like I'm just here to make it my show. I mean, even though I'm in charge of the thing, it's still like I want to make it fun for everybody. Four two is it? Four two. So, so changing the law would be kind of something bad because, I mean, it's almost like Hashem gives a commandment not to change his law like he says specifically tells us he gives us a negative commandment not to change it so if those laws god's change i mean if it did that means we're doing something wrong so let me find it it says in deuteronomy 4 2 it says you shall not add unto the word which i command you neither shall you diminish aught from it that ye may keep the commandments of adonai elohecha the lord your god which i command you so Hashem is specifically saying, you know, don't add it, don't add to it, don't take away from it. You know, if you're going to say we should stop doing this, we should stop doing that, you got to have to take certain things away. Um, let's see, I think there's another place that's important too. Oh, another place is Deuteronomy 12.32. Let's see, what did I get out there? Deuteronomy 12.32. Yeah, I, I feel like it basically says the same thing. Deuteronomy 12, 32. I'm surprised nobody's watching. That's crazy. So it says, What thing soever I command you, observe it, do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Because sometimes Hashem like sees this as like very like... Hashem seems very adamant about this sometimes if you read throughout his Bible. He's like very stern on, This is my law. Do not mess with this thing. It's perfect. You don't... If, you, if it's perfect, then anything... Any going as anyone going astray from it if you go astray from it in any kind of way you're gonna lead yourself to destruction so uh, let me see let's see oh there's another one Matthew 518 that's a big one let's see where's that I mean, everybody's heard that one that comes right after you say you didn't come to the ball with it you know Matthew 518 he says now this is remember this is in regards to does the law change? This is very this is Yeshua saying on the uh, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. He says, "For verily I say unto this is KJV again. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot, nor one tittle, in no wise, pass from the Torah, the law, till all be fulfilled." So <coughs> Yeshua fulfilled a lot of things, you know, when it, when he died on the cross, but. He'd, uh, he didn't fulfill everything. Not everything has been fulfilled. I mean, if that, if everything was fulfilled, what do we need a book of Revelation for? <laughs> we have an entire book, of, an extra book in the New Testament about stuff that's going to happen in the future. Yeshua himself gives a bunch of prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled. When Yeshua died on the cross, it was not like the days of Noah, as he said it was going to be. At least I don't think so. I mean, there was some bad stuff going on, but it wasn't like to the point of you got some Nephilim running around. But, um... Uh, but yeah, so Yeshua says, you know, not a single jot or tittle will pass from the Torah. If you're going to get rid of something such as the dietary instructions, which is what we're talking about tonight, you have to get rid of entire chapters. <laughs> I mean, that's entire chapters passing from the law. Um, and he said, what, what's, let me see. Whosoever, there's a place where he says until, wait, yeah, he said until all has been fulfilled, but where he says somewhere, until heaven, yeah, he says, until heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle will pass from the Torah. Heaven and earth are still here, so, you know, based on that, we probably shouldn't assume that it's changed. So, can we say that after Yeshua comes, they, then the law is not going to be valid, probably? Well, 
here's the thing. The Tol- it is said, I think Shaul says in Romans, that the Torah was added for transgressions. So, when Yeshua comes back, you know, after we get our glorified bodies, we will not be, we will never go against God's Torah, so there really won't be a need for it. It's because yeah. we don't need anything telling us not to do this, not to do that, because we won't be doing that stuff. Yeah. We'll be automatically fulfilling God's Torah. It's like, He's going to have it, we're going to have it on our hearts to the point that, you know, we'll never break it. Right. At least when, you know, those the faithful who endure to the end will be able to receive that, and it'll be only a blessing. So, let me see. I think there's another scripture somewhere, too. That was Matthew 5, 17 through... Oh, God's commandments are not temporary. So that kind of comes in with the same thing as what I just read. So I was really highlighting 18, but verse 17, Yeshua... You know, is God's Torah temporary? He said, Do not think that I have come to destroy the Torah, the law, or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Yeshua came to fulfill it. Um, and we need to understand that in Yeshua's Jewish culture, fulfill does not mean something to do it and complete it in the sense that it doesn't have to be done anymore. Um, it, Yeshua growing up in a Jewish culture, and people still use this term, to fulfill the Torah means to give like an accurate like application of it. Like if you got like a kid in a yeshiva learning from his called rabbi, and the kid in yeshiva really gets something right like he really shows whoever he's learning under a really profound understanding of the scriptures the the um the teacher might like kind of you know make them feel good and say wow you have fulfilled the torah you have done uh, appropriate um, application so if yeshua did mean that it wouldn't make a lot of sense because whoever was listening to him wouldn't get that because that's not the culture that um based on the culture the word fulfill in jewish culture that's what fulfill pretty much means it's a cultural thing. You gotta understand Yeshua's culture that it lived in, or else you're gonna you're gonna miss things. You're gonna miss a lot. So, <coughs> so, so we're gonna move on. Which question is that? That was number three. So we're on question number four. Question number four is: What happens if someone teaches others to break God's commandments? If God's commandments don't change and they're not temporary, if somebody says you shouldn't do this even though the Torah says to do it, what does the Torah say? What does the um, Hashem's word say about it? Uh, let's see. Let's go to Deuteronomy 13. This is important. This is where we get the foundation of uh, basically teachers who teach against God's Torah based on what the Bible says. Let's go to Deuteronomy. It's in Deuteronomy chapter. <coughs> Chapter 13. That's, I shouldn't even have to look that up. I know this chapter. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna read the whole thing because it's kind of important to understand.